I'm Milton Schoen and welcome to America Salutes. Today we have three members of our staff who are, have participated in demobilization and the reintegration of National Guard troops coming back from Iraq uh, and they've done that at uh, uh, Fort Dix, Camp Shelby and Fort McCoy amongst other places and uh, I'd like to start by uh, uh, discussing with them the fact that each of them have been deployed. So, uh, Stefa, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your deployments? Sure. Um, I was deployed to um, Southwest Asia, and I was in Iraq and throughout Southwest Asia. I was um, attached to a civil affairs unit as a medic, so um, throughout the whole time period it was um, pretty traumatic, but it was, um, it was a good tour pretty busy. <laughs> and, and you've been deployed both uh, from an active duty standpoint and also as a reservist? As a reservist, yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, um, Robert, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your deployments? Absolutely. I was active duty for four years in the United States Army. Uh, as an infantryman, I was deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, both deploying from Italy as our home base. and. Uh, both were really successful deployments. Uh, didn't didn't really have the structure of reintegration that that we went through here, but uh, both both very good, very successful deployments. Good. And uh, Daniel. Yeah, I've, I've been in the Minnesota National Guard for almost 11 years now. So about uh, seven years in, I was deployed to Kuwait and Iraq, uh, platoon leader for a convoy security company that basically drove up and down. Uh, what's known as Route Tampa, which hit all the main bases on Iraq, supplying um, them with anything from food to mail to uh, anything in between that. And then on the way back, we would take you know the drawdown, the weapons, the the tanks, and everything like that, and that would be shipped over to Afghanistan. Like Bob, um, really successful deployment. And then when we got back, uh, went through reintegration. Very good, and. Uh, uh, we established our reintegration when we had the uh, major deployment uh, of our Red Bulls to Iraq, uh, the largest uh, deployment since World War II. And the interesting thing there were many of these people were not veterans, and such as yourself, you became a veteran w after your deployment because of your federal service in the deployment. Yep, that's right. Um, like I said, uh, in the National Guard for seven years until I got deployed, and. Um, one thing that people usually don't realize is uh, guard members, even though you know they're they're volunteering and they're uh, doing uh, weekend drills and two week ATs up at places like Camp Ripley and stuff, they don't actually achieve veteran status until they get activated onto active duty like these two were. Right, and uh, Stefa, uh, your deployment uh, in the reserves, you became earned that veteran status. Uh, if you hadn't had a deployment prior to that, y you would have become a veteran because of that deployment as a reservist. That's correct, because it's, it's attending that, um, that active duty time period, the deployment. That will give you a veteran status, yes. And, and one of the purposes of reintegration is to make sure that people get connected to the services, that they sign up for VA health care, that they're interviewed by county veteran service officers like yourself, and we have many teams from the rest of the state that participated in this uh, uh, to do that. And uh, uh, that, that is a critical segment of, of this whole approach. Uh, and um, did you have any, uh, uh, Robert, I think you, you, there were some people made some comments when you were at Fort Dix of uh, the fact that we from Minnesota were there to help our troops, but uh, they didn't see people from their state? Yeah, absolutely. There, there were a number of different states that um, came back home with the Minnesota National Guard that we were there reintegrating, um, and a number of them made that comment, you know, where, where's my state representation? Where are my county veteran service officers? And uh, it didn't take long for them to realize, you know, they weren't there. Um, not that we didn't help them, not that we didn't talk to them and make sure they knew about the benefits that they were entitled to. Um, but it was it was really obvious that you know Minnesota was the ones putting putting their best foot forward and helping their veterans as soon as they hit hit back here in the states. And that we wanted to make sure that people were connected to the services when they got back here, so that they could could succeed when they move forward uh, to civilian life. So, 
Uh, and with that, at this point, we will uh, listen to the uh, DVD that ex explains part of this and shows what we did uh, uh, at Fort McCoy. I'm Milt Schoen. I'm the Hennepin County Veterans Service Officer. Our reintegration initiative with the Minnesota National Guard, our work to make sure that our Minnesota troops who return to Minnesota are connected to the veterans benefits that they've earned, that they get the health care from the VA that they're entitled to, the dental care, and if they sustained any injuries that that story is known and that someone in their county, their county veteran service officer, can help them. That is what this project is about and it's also about the National Guard's efforts to make sure that their troops succeed as they return to civilian life. In 2006, 30 percent of Guard and National Guard troops nationwide enrolled in VA health care when they return from their deployments. Because of this initiative in Minnesota, over 99% of our Minnesota National Guard troops returning from deployment are enrolled in VA health care. After a National Guard troop completes his or her service to their country, they fly back. They're greeted by fellow soldiers as they come off the airplane. They're recognized for what they've done. Then they're bussed back to their fort for demobilization. They will go through several days of, of briefings and filling out paperwork. The last day, they will be bussed in to the demobilization site. They get off the buses and they walk in and they're welcomed by all the county veteran service officers and all the other providers and thanked for the service that they provided our country. National Guard troops who have been on previous deployments will share their experiences and some of the pitfalls that they went through upon their return to civilian life and will tell them about what the rest of the evening is going to be like. They will go into breakout sessions. They'll be meeting uh, on motor vehicle safety with the State Highway Patrol. That They'll meet, be meeting with the job service people. They'll be meeting with people from the Department of Revenue and being connected to them. They'll meet with Bob Davis, who's the chair of our County Veteran Service Officer Reintegration Committee, and he will tell them what they are going to be doing with County Veteran Service Officers that evening. Our only job is to work for you and your, your families and uh, we want to make sure that you're back 20 years from now better than you were when you left a year ago. That's my goal. Then before you leave this room, you will meet with the County Veteran Service Officer for a one-on-one -on -one of any concerns or issues that you have while you've been deployed, while you've been activated during your National Guard career. And we have them tell the stories about what happened to them during their deployment so if they sustained any injuries, that we would be able to apply them for benefits. This is what we did in Minnesota to make sure that our National Guard troops could succeed in their community, with their family, and in the future. It actually ties into our community outreach effort as well, where we're developing uh, yellow ribbon communities, yellow ribbon counties and cities, churches, campuses and schools and companies because we're trying to build these enduring networks of support. Yes, I did deploy actually and came back in 2007. It was a year later actually that I actually went and sought out my county vice service officer only because I met him here the year before. And it was that face-to-face -face connection you see when I realized it wasn't just a guy on a piece of paper or a phone number. I met Stuart person so I knew where to go and people like Bob Davis, who you know, it's people like that who advocate for us in person that makes the difference. So a year later, I did seek out help with the VA, and I got service connected, and I got, I got my problems taken care of in the most professional and timely manner, more than I ever expected. 
Welcome back. Um, you've just seen a, a video of our 2010 uh, demobilization at Fort McCoy. Uh, and uh, uh, part of what we accomplished was uh, uh, we've gone from 30% of our guard being enrolled in VA health care uh, when they returned from Iraq to 98% of Minnesota because of the efforts of, uh, of these men and women. And uh, now we'd like to hear um, some of their stories about uh, their work uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, the demobilization site. So Stefa, uh, could you share some of your experiences in working with troops as they return? Sure. Uh, you know, I had to relate it back to me coming back and it's just like we didn't have anything like this at all. You know, we had the pre-deployment um, lines and the re and coming back it was just like a little checklist running around and you know, it's it's just um, it was just kind of frenetic. So most of the people that were coming back, you know, I I knew how they felt and I knew that this was like a great thing to get them, you know, reintegrated back into it and let them know what's what's going on. Um, we had plenty of people and we had long, long hours, you know, just in the processing line, just explaining to them what their um, b benefits are. And um, it was it was great. I really felt fabulous doing that because I'm going, I really wish I had something like that when I came back. Very good. Um, Bob, uh, can you relay some of the stories of your work out at Fort Dix? Absolutely. A lot of what Stefa said as well. Um, coming home, you know, you, they were on active duty, there wasn't that same structure that you saw when you were at these demobilization sites of the National Guard. Um, you know, you came home and it, it was more or less, you know, here's your 30 days of leave and get ready because you're going to deploy again. Um, the active duty cycles for deployments are about 9 to 12 months. Um, so you, you don't really have that time to come back down to earth, so to speak, and make sure that you're good to go for the next mission because, you know, it, it's coming and you've got to be ready. Um, so to be able to see the effect that you can have on somebody to make sure that they are you know, back down to earth, not not going 100 miles an hour anymore. Uh, it's, it's a really nice feeling. Very good. And uh, Dan, uh, you've seen this from both uh, pr the perspective in 2010, I believe, of of of, uh, uh, of, uh, of being a troop coming back and now providing service to uh, those same troops. Yeah, it was it was really full circle for me. Uh, if you look at it, big picture, from spring 2010 to spring 2012, so almost less than 24 months, I was going through it to providing it to people who, you know, they were in my shoes um, two years later. I saw a lot of uh, my soldiers that I had deployed with come through again. Like Bobby said, um, you know, the, the amount of deployments, it increases and people get sent over there quite a bit. So it was interesting to see their growth. Um, it was also interesting just to kind of see, okay, yeah, this is definitely where I was. Deer in the headlights, it's, it can be overwhelming, kind of like Stefa was saying. And um, the one thing that, that I figured out going through myself was um, everything's going 100 miles an hour. And when those Minnesota folks get in the room and start talking to you, that's when you can kind of start to breathe. You sit down with your county veteran service officer and they start to go over some of the, some of the stuff that you qualify for, which is a ton of stuff. And um, it was just kind of a good time for me to sit down with them and have that opportunity to to explain to them what what they um, qualify for now. And in addition to us, we had the job service there and support the Garden Reserve. Uh, Minuscu was there. Uh, people were getting edu educational information. Um, State Patrol was there uh, for motorcycle safety, uh, and uh, it was a holistic approach. Everybody went through their, uh, you know, presentation. Things had changed since we had gotten back, so that's why the state patrol was there, outlying uh, different laws that came into effect. And it was just a good time for us to kind of, all right, get ready. You're going back into uh, society, and and you know, it's just just a good time to get ready for that. Very good. And one of the things that we achieved was uh, uh, by getting people into VA healthcare. The cost of their health care is not falling back on the county uh, or the state through Medicaid and uh, or the private employer. 
and we're getting people connected to services so that they can be successful. So with that, thank you for your help, and uh, once again, thank you for watching America Salutes. I'm Milton Schoen, and welcome to Mirror on the Metro. Today, we've got Representative Diane Loeffler from Northeast Minneapolis, who is uh, our guest and uh, actually is the first legislator to appear on the silver anniversary for uh, MCN. Well, I'm so glad to be here, Milt, and I'm so glad to say happy anniversary to uh, to MCN. Um, 25 years ago, we didn't know what cable would grow into, and now it's become a vital part of our community and a great way to get a variety of messages out, as well as to display a lot of artistic and creative talent that I don't think we imagined 25 years ago. But I'm so glad the new studios of MCN, where we are today, are in the heart of the Minneapolis Arts District, which is part of my uh, legislative district. It, we're surrounded by galleries. Um, we have over 700 visual artists and uncounted numbers of performing artists, and MCN and its creative energy really fits right in here. So I'm honored to be here. Very good. Tell us about some of the initiatives that you've had for Northeast Minneapolis and the city here in the last session. Well, you know, this year has was a bonding year. And um, so some of the things that I worked on were not so specific to Northeast Minneapolis because we've kind of had our share of most recent bonding packages with bridges. And I'm delighted that finally this year, this fall, we are going to once again be connected to the rest of Minneapolis through the beautiful new Lowry Avenue Bridge. It's an, a sculpture in its own right. Um, I hope people will really appreciate that gateway um, arch as they come through our area and it connects north and northeast. And then the Plymouth Avenue Bridge, surprisingly, a fairly relatively young bridge, um, ran into some pro cabling problems and it will be opening up as as well and so the last two bonding bills I've had to be out there asking for um, bridge money and so this time around I'm letting some of that that funding go elsewhere but one of the things I'm most excited about and all of Minnesota should be excited about and that's restoration of our beautiful capital it's uh, over 150 years old or 100 10 years old rather, the state's over 150 years old. We had a couple old ones before then, one burnt down, which is why we used a lot of stone. And this one, it's not gonna burn. But unfortunately, our beautiful marble's falling apart. Um, it's literally coming off because of the acid in the atmosphere. Um, we have leaky walls and leaky ceilings, and it's time to step up. And we stepped up with about $40 million of what ultimately would be a quarter of a billion dollar project. And a smaller investment now will prevent more substantial spending going forward? Absolutely, you know, it's just like your house. If you don't stop the water coming in on that leaky roof, all of a sudden you got mold, you got walls that are falling apart, you got lots of problems. We gotta do that with our wonderful old building. And you mentioned uh, the two bridges uh, crossing the river. That should have a positive economic impact on both sides of the river of the businesses that are located there, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, the more that you're, I said we're, bec we're becoming an island when we were so disconnected. First, we lost the 35W Bridge in that very tragic ex accident. And then to lose the Lowry Bridge and the Plymouth Bridge, we've just kind of lost a lot of the connection um, to other parts of the state and the state and the other metro coming into us. And so I think it's gonna be good for commerce on both sides of the river. It's gonna be good for our school kids as they, and we're gonna have new bus routes that are gonna be crossing on Broadway and, and on Lowry as a result of um, the reduced traffic that's right now all funneled onto Broadway. Now, statewide, uh, there are many issues, uh, some that were addressed and some that remain to be addressed. So maybe we can start at that point. Sure, you know, this was an interesting session and um, you know, there was a lot of tension points and I think we're gonna see that playing out through the fall because um, the Republican and Democratic parties have different philosophies on how to make our economy grow and that's going to be a continued debate all the way through November. And Minnesota's been pretty divided recently and this time we ended up with a Democratic governor, Mark Dayton, with majorities in the House and the Senate both being Republican for the first time in 40 years. And so they created some tension points, there were a lot of vetoes. 
Um, but there were some areas that we agreed on. Um, one of those vetoes, unfortunately, has resulted in a, a constitutional amendment, uh, something that I think didn't doesn't belong in our Constitution. It could be handled through law. That's where other states across the nation handle it, and that's how do you allow for voting? And what do people need to establish that that's the place they live and that's where they should vote? Um, there's a constitutional amendment people are voting on this fall on requiring a photo ID. And it sounds so simple um, until you realize that so many people don't have, give, seniors have given up their driver's license. And to reestablish that ID means getting a birth certificate from maybe another state. Um, you know, it's, if someone's old and given up driving, it typically means they're in ill health. Um, and so their willingness and ability to go down to, you know, the courthouse during daytime hours and, you know, stand in line and get that birth certificate so they can prove who they are, get the picture taken. You know, for some people it's going to be a sacrifice. For some kids who are moving here to go to graduate school at the U, um, it's not the kind of thing they pack when they're packing their suitcases to come to school. And um, so whether or not they're going to be able to get their home state to respond fast enough um, to establish that, I think, is a question that, um, is we don't need to face. There's been no proof of, of fraud, but that's going to be one that we'll be debating. Um, we're also going to be debating how to deal with our economy. Um, we're going to be facing another deficit, unfortunately. Um, the projections are that it could be as big as three or four billion dollars when you add on the fact that we borrowed 2.4 billion dollars from our schools um, in the shutdown of last summer in order to balance the budget and we need to establish a plan. That's one of my disappointments this year is we didn't establish a plan to pay them back. So that's going to be one of our first agenda items next year. And when you deal with the deficit, it always comes out into what's your philosophy, what's most important. Should we be investing in our education, in our health care system, in providing property tax relief for families or individuals, or do we need to, um, the more classic Republican approach is to give breaks to business so that they'll hire and so that you know, the economy can grow through that philosophy. I don't think we've seen that happen as effectively as direct aid to people in cities and counties. Um, so I think it's going to be a lively debate um, all throughout this fall, and the voters will decide in November. And the federal government uh, would be reducing uh, between uh, $500 billion in defense over 10 years and $500 billion in domestic spending over 10 years if they don't come to some agreement. But I suspect as a legislator, whenever the Fed uh, makes that decision, uh, the federal government does that, you will have to respond because that can impact programs that serve our citizens. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we have intergovernmental partnerships at all levels, and w for example, half of our Medicaid program, which provides most of the care for our uh, disabled people, um, as well as people who have um, spent down all of their assets as seniors um, and may be in a nursing home or need high-end health care. And so n if we were to have a major cutback in, for example, federal support for Medicaid, that would be very difficult for us to do anything but to step up with, as a state with, you know, state dollars because, you know, while there are differences about, you know, who's most needy and at what level do you prove your need, um, I think all Minnesotans come together in thinking that people with disabilities ought to be cared for and cared for in a way that, sh that gives them the best opportunity to have a life of satisfaction. And the same thing with our seniors. You know, once someone has spent down all of their life savings, we're not going to throw them out on the street. And um, so depending upon where those federal cuts come from in transportation, we're heavily dependent on that. Uh, one of my disappointments was that we didn't fund the Southwest Light Rail Line, um, where for $25 million of state investment, we would have gotten almost a billion dollars of federal um, investment. Um, and so, you know, we're on thinner ice now going into the future that, that maybe the federal transportation budget will be one of those budgets that get cut and our opportunities to build that transit system um, may be limited. So where do you see the state uh, moving um, to make sure that we're economically successful in the future? Uh, what investments do you think are critical for our state to make to be successful? and uh, to have our economy grow? Well, you know, I think one of our best investments can be in education at all levels. If we, part of why Minnesota has been successful more than many states with more Fortune 500 companies than almost any state um, is because we've had this really highly educated, strong workforce. 
And we need to really step up and make sure that we're investing so that our kids are ready to compete in a global economy. The other thing that I think is really exciting for us is that our metropolitan area is home to people from throughout the world. And now that we're part of a global economy, having people who have learned two languages at home and um, our native speakers in a language of commerce that can connect us to other parts of the world, we could become one of the 25 to 30 international trade centers just because of our diversity and the fact that we have brands that everyone across the globe that's in a developed country um, and in many of the emerging companies knows. I mean, 3M, General Mills, Medtronics. I mean, we have companies that are known across the globe. So we've got relationships we can work on. And so I think there's some exciting times for Minnesota in competing. Um, but to do that, we're going to have to make sure we have those young workers ready and able to, to interact in that high tech um, and much more global economy because it's not just about the U.S. anymore. Right. Um, the demographics of our state are changing and we have a large number of baby boomers who will be retiring. And as a state policymaker, uh, we're going to see many more people uh, in their no longer in the workforce and utilizing some of the programs and that must present some challenges. Well actually you know most people don't get to dependency till they hit their 80s, late 70s and so um, the needs of the boomers for supportive services is still a couple of decades out I think generally. You know we'll have some early people on who need hip replacements and other things just because they've been athletes their whole lives um, or have other issues but I think um, we're going to have a, two decades of wonderful opportunity because we have we'll have retirees who want to do more than just play golf and you know play with the grandkids that want to do something meaningful to contribute and I think one of our biggest challenges is to make sure that we create as a state and as a community the right opportunities for people to step up and use the skills and talents that they developed during their professional career um, or new careers that they would like to do. They could be volunteers in our schools. They can be, um, my husband coordinates a program in which retired engineers do energy audits um, for nonprofits and schools that couldn't afford an expensive environmental consulting company um, but can help them reduce their operating costs. And so I think that's going to be the model of the future is to try and create some, some new opportunities. The downside is when people retire, they earn less money. And a lot of it will be tax-free out of their savings or Roth or that sort of thing. And so our income as a state will go down. Um, and we're starting to wrestle now with what does that mean for tax policy and our ability to keep um, our schools funded, our transportation system funded, our you know, energy and environment programs funded. And that's going to be the challenge for us because retirees don't spend as much money. They're not going out for lunch every, you know, five days a week. And the challenge is to set the priorities because whatever resources you have, uh, that will determine what you're able to invest in education or health care or transportation uh, as we move forward. That's absolutely right. And that to me is the priorities. This should be the discussion that we have between now and November. Very good. Are we going to stick up for the middle class? Are we going to invest in education? That's what's ahead of us. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Loeffler, and thank you for appearing on Mirror on the Metro. And we appreciate your being our first guest uh, uh, of any legislator in our silver anniversary. I'm honored. Thank you very much, and happy anniversary. Thank you.